Good evening. My name is Lynn Thomas, and it's my great pleasure as Chair of the Department of History to welcome you to our 2012 History Lecture Series. Thank you so much for attending. I'm thrilled to see such a large audience and delighted that so many people will get a chance to hear Professor Margaret O'Mara, one of our truly outstanding members of the history faculty. As some of you may have realized, this is the first year that this lecture series is being held in the autumn. The Department of History is proud to be the sole host of the series this year, and we look forward to continue, continuing it in years to come. While I've been in the History Department for 15 years, um, I've only been in the position of chair for a couple of months. Yet already, I've had the opportunity to meet a number of wonderful history alumni and supporters, some of whom are here tonight. I look forward to meeting many more of you in um, the years to come as my tenure as chair. Now, my own area of expertise is African history. Prior to 2008, I would have said that, 20th that the 20th century history of Kenya, the time period and the place that I've studied the most, had few, if any, direct connections to US presidential elections. <laughs> Our 44th president, however, has changed all of that. Now, people in Kenya and across the African continent follow U.S. elections very closely, almost as closely as elections happening in their own countries. Of course, for at least the past 100 years, U.S. presidential elections have had far-reaching consequences both here and across the globe. Thus, the subject of the lecture series this year Pivotal Tuesdays could not be more important or more timely. So a few words about the format for these lectures. Margaret's lectures will extend for one hour, and then she'll follow them with about 20 or 30 minutes of question and answer. There will be no break between the lecture portion and the question and answer portion. I'll ask now that if you haven't already turned off your cell phones, um, that you please do so, so that we can proceed without interruptions. Before handing the microphone over to John Finley, who will properly introduce Margaret, I would like to thank a number of people without whom this series would not be possible. My first debt of gratitude is to five fantastic staff members in the Department of History who have worked tirelessly in recent months to pull this series together. Um, those staff members are Stephanie Stark, Matt Erickson, Jerry Park, Cassie Atkinson um, Edwards, and Bryce Barrick. For their support of this series, I'd also like to thank Judy Howard, our Divisional Dean in the Social Sciences, Carolyn Black from the Advancement Office, and Randy Hodgins, from external affairs. I would also like to thank UWTV for partnering, for partnering with us to record and then to broadcast all of the lectures. Um, so the lectures will begin airing the Thursday after they're given. So tonight's lecture will begin airing on UWTV this Thursday, um, October 11th. Now some of you likely know John Finley as a former chair of the Department of History. These past few months, he's proven, proven an invaluable mentor for me as I take on my new duties within the department. He has also been instrumental in organizing this lecture series. And for all of that, I'm very grateful um, to him. Um, then finally, thanks again to all of you for coming. I look forward to seeing you same time, same place, for the next three Tuesdays. And I'll now hand the floor over to John. Thank you. Good evening. It's my very pleasant task to introduce Margaret O'Mara, the speaker who tonight and over the next three Tuesdays 
will steer us through the history of presidential elections in the 20th century. Margaret O'Mara is an associate professor of history at the University of Washington. She joined us in 2007 after teaching at Stanford. When I consider her achievements at this early stage of her career, I'm especially impressed by two traits. First, Margaret is fearless. Her geographical, topical, and chronological range is extraordinary. Second, Margaret has a remarkable ability to reach diverse audiences, other scholars, students, and the public. On top of these two virtues, Margaret not only excels at whatever she does, she makes it look easy. For those of us with less courage and less talent, it's unnerving to watch her, let alone introduce her. Let me explain a little bit about her range. Professor O'Mara first wrote about Silicon Valley, that famous hub of innovation that emerged in the San Francisco Bay Area after World War II. Her book appeared in 2005 and is called Cities of Knowledge, Cold War Science, and the Search for the Next Silicon Valley. It explains not only how California Silicon Valley succeeded, but also how attempts to replicate this in Atlanta and Philadelphia failed. Margaret's next project takes this topic even further afield. She's looking at efforts in India and China to replicate Silicon Valley. All historians recognize the virtue of comparative history, but few of us are brave enough or skilled enough to actually do it. Uh, for me, learning the complexities of one country is enough. Margaret's mastering three countries to write her next book. If you think for a minute about Margaret's research interests, you begin to see immediately how her work intersects with so many themes and topics. She covers many of these themes and topics in her teaching. She's offered courses on, for example, urban and suburban history, on welfare, on party politics and the presidency, on California and the West, and many other issues. These courses are always received warmly by students. And many of these students come from fields other than history because, again, Margaret's work intersects with so many different disciplines, planning, politics, economics, and so on. As you'll be able to see for yourselves, she's a marvelous classroom teacher. Another distinguishing trait is Margaret's ability to engage the public. Most historians, like me, in truth, prefer to deal with subjects who are dead and gone. <laughs> we want to write about people who won't talk back to you, challenge what you say. Margaret is different. As I said, her skills enable her to make contributions to the arenas of public policy and political debate. There's a section on her CV, not mine, for policy publications, and another for commentary. In other words, she speaks to the public, she's engaged in the real world, uh, she wants to discuss current events. To illustrate, let me note uh, some of the journals she's published in. I've published in dry academic journals. Margaret has too, but she also has published in dry non-historical academic journals. <laughs> <coughs> Foreign Policy, Interdisciplinary Sciences Review, the journal that technology transfer. What is technology transfer? <laughs> uh, less boringly, Margaret's pieces have appeared in the Seattle Times, in Crosscut, in a journal called Boom, colon, a journal of California. One of her most interesting pieces uh, appeared in High Country News, portraying Arnold Schwarzenegger as the newest progressive. Uh, I hope she'll revise that soon. <laughs> because Margaret understands how high-tech economies work, because she understands how higher education contributes to economic prosperity, She's been an invaluable asset to the state of Washington and the University of Washington. Her policy writings and her service have focused on how the University of Washington contributes to the economy of the state. And she's helping advise the university on the development of the university district, and she's examining uh, the development of South Lake Union as a center of innovation. She's also consulting with Seattle's Museum of Fish and Industry as it develops its center for innovation. Where does someone with these sorts of abilities come from? Well, Margaret has some other predictable credentials, a BA in history and English from Northwestern, an MA and PhD in history from the University of Pennsylvania. But Margaret also spent six years 
in Washington, D.C., where she worked in the White House. She worked for the Department of Health and Human Services, and she worked at a think tank. Her portfolio included the issues of urban affairs, economic development, welfare and poverty, health care, and other aspects of domestic policy. Thus, her facility for dealing with current policy questions has been arrived at the hard way. She's also been a spectator at presidential elections from the inside, as well as from the outside. It's a remarkable skill set. To my mind, Margaret O'Mara's background in history, in government, and in other spheres makes her an ideal speaker for this lecture series. Please join me in welcoming Margaret O'Mara to the podium. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's such an honor to be speaking as the 2012 UW History Lecturer. And it's so great to, that all of you all are here. Thank you so much for being here, for your support of the History Department, for your support of the university. And, uh, and I think we have a room full of political junkies here. Is <laughs> political junkies? Uh, how many people have been voting for a really long time? All right. Good civic participation. Uh, how many people voted for the first time in the last decade or so? All right. Is there anyone here who's not yet old enough to vote? All right. And you can't wait to do it. Well, I'm really, thank you all for being here. And I hope that, um, that the next hour and the next three Tuesdays will help illuminate something and help inform how you think about the political process and your understanding of presidential history. So, uh, so let's get started. Um, first, let me make a confession. I had a really hard time deciding which elections to choose. There are 25 elections in the 20th century. Fortunately, I just stuck to one century, but 25 elections. I only had four nights. So why did I choose the elections that I chose? I chose ones that not only were full of great stories, and great personalities, but also ones that showed important shifts in politics and policy that helped us understand the evolution of the presidency, of party politics, over the past hundred years. So tonight we're going to talk about the election of 1912, our first pivotal Tuesday. It's hard for us to imagine what life was like 100 years ago. So let's start off by exploring how 1912 is different from today. In 1912, some of the biggest celebrities in America were politicians. This is Theodore Roosevelt, a Republican ex-president, war hero, larger than life personality. Teddy was one of the most famous men in America in 1912. And as you'll soon hear, tens of thousands of people came out to see him everywhere he gave a speech. He was followed by hundreds of reporters tracking his every move. He was front page news from coast to coast. And he was a person with a lasting legacy, both in politics and in popular culture. Even today, my daughters have teddy bears. Now, in 2012, some of the biggest celebrities in America are reality TV stars, not ex-presidents and war heroes. In 1912, the party conventions were where American political parties chose their presidential nominees. And these could be real nail biters. For example, in 1912, the Democrats took 46 rounds of balloting before they decided on Woodrow Wilson as their nominee. 46. It's different now. In 2012, the primaries are where we vote and choose the party nominees. And the conventions are really just infomercials. Another big difference was the size of government in people and its role in ordinary people's lives. And this is a very big distinction. Then the size of the military was about 4,800 service personnel, less than 50K. Federal government spending per capita was about $129. Federal 
the federal budget was about 10% of gross domestic product. Today, the US Department of Defense is the largest employer in the world. And we have 1.4 million service personnel. Yes, the US population is bigger, but actually if you adjusted for population, that would mean if we had still had the same size military we had in uh, 100 years ago, it would be about 200,000 active service personnel. Per capita spending is more than $7,100. And the federal budget? 40% of gross domestic product. So the government is a much bigger player in all of our lives, whether we like it or not. In 1912, one candidate was a best-selling author who talked about hope and change. He called on government to do more to help ordinary people. He was a Republican. His opponent was a highly intelligent, sometimes stiff guy. He promised a new freedom that would keep big institutions from trampling individual liberties. He was a Democrat. In 1912, grassroots groups were talking about Main Street versus Wall Street, protecting the little guy from the predatory wealthiest 1%. They were calling for cleaning up government as well. They were frustrated with gridlock in Washington, DC. Is this all sounding very familiar? But here's the difference. They were calling for a more activist government to fix these problems. And in 1912, the Socialist Party had a broad base of national support, had elected mayors in two large American cities. In 2012, socialism is a dirty word. In 1912, capitalism was a dirty word. We have two major party candidates. And in 1912, we had four. Who were they? Well, there was the incumbent seeking re-election, Republican William Howard Taft. His party had had control of the White House and almost unbroken since the Civil War. Then there was his Democratic challenger, Democratic um, New Jersey Governor Woodrow Wilson, a former history professor, a college president, and a new type of Democrat who was trying to lead his party out of the political wilderness. Then mixing up the race was labor leader Eugene B. Debs, who was running for the third time on the Socialist Party ticket. And then, last but not least, the man himself, the teddy bear, Theodore Roosevelt. Ex-president, coming back. He, he first runs for the Republican nomination, fails to get it, breaks from his party, and runs as a third party candidate. And I'm going to tell you how that happened tonight. So but before we do that, why was 1912 a pivotal election? There are three reasons. One, it realigned the political parties. Both the Democrats and the Republicans came out of 1912 at different, different entities than they were going into it. The second thing was that it was the beginning of presidential politics as we know it. A politics that was about the candidate, not about the political party that he represented. And the third thing was that 1912 refined, it was, it, was an, it was a debate about redefining the role of government in industrial America. All four candidates generally agreed on the basic premise that government needed to do more, needed to redefine its function. They just differed on the way to get there. And so those three things are what I'm going to talk about tonight. But before we get to the parties, the candidates, the policy debates, let's step back and look at the context or as we like to call it around here, history. In 1860, three out of four Americans lived in the countryside or small towns. Most of them were farmers. There was no city in the US that was more than a million people. In the next three decades, all of this would change. Everything got bigger. Farm production doubled, population tripled, manufacturing grew six times over. 
This meant three big changes in the way that many Americans lived and worked. One, industry and people urbanized. In 1860, only six million Americans lived in cities. In 1910, 44 million people lived in cities. New York City alone was nearly five million people. Second thing, people left the farms and went to go work in factories, in mines, building railroads, a completely different rhythm of work. And many of these jobs were pretty awful. They ranged from moderately to very dangerous. There were no worker protections, working 12 hour days, six hours a week, uh, six days a week. Men, women, children, um, very few, uh, very low pay, very few benefits. It goes on and on. Um, this, of course, leads to many hor horrific industrial accidents. One that still remains very well known today that many of the high, school, high schoolers in this audience might have read about in their textbooks was the 1911 fire at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City, where 146 young immigrant women perished, burned to death in their sweatshop. The third thing was immigration. Millions of immigrants came to the United States, many, most of them during this period from Southern and Eastern Europe. 12 million people arrived in the United States between 1870 and 1900. Um, during this period, the U.S. was about one-seventh foreign-born. One-seventh of the U.S. population was foreign-born. In the big cities, this was even more intensely concentrated. 4 percent foreign-born in 1910. Seattle, 28 percent foreign-born. So the world around, the, the world that our four presidential candidates were born in, in the 1850s, was a completely different America than the one in which they ran for president. And these transformations were driving the politics, were driving the way people voted, were driving the emotion and the, and the, the politics of, and policies of this campaign. So to understand 1912, we have to understand this transformation of the United States. It was, now not to say it was all bad, this was an era of immense progress, technological progress. This is the age of Edison, of Bell, of the telegraph, the telephone, the light bulb. But it was also an era of extreme poverty and income inequality, like the US had never seen before. Now the power and the reach of the giant industries uh, exceeded anything else in the United States, including the national government. And this was another hallmark of this period. Industry not, over, not only overshadowed government in size, but it had Washington, D.C. in its pocket. We worry about Washington being governed by special interests today. Whew. Let me tell you about the Gilded Age. So all of these problems changed the political landscape. Americans saw crowded, unhealthy cities, terrible factory working conditions, mass immigration of people who were decidedly unlike the people who were already here. They saw immense growth of massive corporations that they called the money trusts. And they saw corruption at every level of government. Solutions to these problems came from different places. One came from the industrial work workers themselves and the men and women who were their leaders. Their power came from collective action. When you have really big, ind big industries employing thousands of people, the way those people can make their voices heard is by walking out on strike. They also fought for worker protections. They sought to alleviate poverty. And they railed against the trusts and the capitalist system that created them. Now, we live in a time when politics, radical politics, is seen as, well, pretty well radical. Uh, the, the big strikes that make news and that people feel affect their lives are ones where millionaire ball players strike against billionaire uh, sports team owners, or when refs are locked out of uh, NFL, uh, NFL games. Unions representing working class and middle class people these days have really taken a political beating. So it's hard to imagine the influence that labor activism had during this period, but it was big. 
For one, when single companies had this much power, a strike could bring national commerce to a halt. So this is what happened in 1894, when 30,000 workers at the Pullman Sleeping Car Company in Chicago walked out, demanding higher wages, better working conditions. This was the moment when Eugene Debs went, got in the national spotlight. He was leader of the Railway Workers Union, and he mobilized workers on the railroads across the country in support of the Pullman, the Pullman strikers. The workers refused to couple Pullman cars to trains. Engineers wouldn't drive them. The entire national rail system ground to a halt. This was such a crisis that the government intervened. President Grover Cleveland dispatched US soldiers to restore the peace and get the trains running. Eugene Debs went to prison for blocking interstate commerce. And when he emerged, he was a national celebrity, a hero of the working man. He went on to, he was a lifelong Democrat. Grover Cleveland, a Democratic president, was the one who, who ended, his, uh, ended the Pullman strike. So Debs left the Democratic Party, switched to the Socialist Party, and ran on the Socialist ticket starting in 1904. When industrial conditions were this bad, the message of someone like Eugene Debs resonated with many, many people. And for some, that seemed to be the only answer, but not to everybody. Another set of people horrified by what was happening were the native-born middle-class professionals. While they had many different causes, the different waves of reform they came to, that they led, came to be known under the umbrella title of progressivism. Like the labor movement, they also want to protect, wanted to protect workers. Like the labor movement, they also wanted to alleviate poverty, to keep the trusts, the big money capitalists in line. But they also diverged from working class heroes like Debs in some critical ways. Some progressive reformers thought the best way to solve the challenges of immigration was to Americanize the new arrivals, to assimilate them into society. Now this approach, combined with the extraordinary level of prejudice in early 20th century society against racial minorities, African Americans, and others, really meant that the progressives were not all that progressive when it came to racial issues. And it's important to keep that in mind and putting them in historical perspective. The progressive movement was also interested in cleaning up government. Now Teddy Roosevelt was a classic good government progressive. He had made quite a name for himself in the 1890s as the New York City police commissioner, railing against machine politics, the corruption inherent in local politics, and New York's Tammany Hall, which is one of the, the greatest, most legendary political machines. But because, and because pro progressives found regular politics pretty dirty, many of these reformers preferred to mobilize outside of formal politics. This actually opened up space for people who were not uh, not allowed to engage in formal politics. Women had a very prominent role in many progressive movements. And to understand women's suffrage, you need to understand the power of progressivism during this moment. But by the time the, the early 20, the, by the time of the turn of the 20th century, it became clear that everything had become so big. Industry had become so big. Problems, cities have become so big, the problems of poverty have become so large, that you couldn't keep on mobilizing outside formal politics. It was time to get involved. It was time to get political. So let's move to the story of how the Democrats and the Republicans were changed by 1912 in this progressive moment. But first, one important thing to understand about presidential politics is that it's about people, and it can get personal. And we like to think that statesmen rise above it all. It's all about big ideas and vision. But sometimes it's about petty things. Sometimes it's about friendships gone bad. Sometimes it's about feelings that trump, emo, trump reason. And we have to remember that all of these, these politicians, past and present, are just human beings. And they have a, uh, sometimes they take things personally. Here's a story that shows that. It started with a thank you note. The person who wrote it 
William Howard Taft, seemed like an uninteresting president to many of his contemporaries. It might have been because he was uninterested in being president. <laughs> you see, Taft didn't move up in the political world by running for office and winning elections. He just got a series of administrative jobs, judicial appointments. His greatest dream was to be on the Supreme Court. That's what he really wanted to do. But he, he kept on rising up through politics. He once wrote that his professional rise was due to having his, quote, plate the right side up when the offices are falling. By 1904, the office that had fallen on Taft's plate was as Theodore Roosevelt's Secretary of War. And he and Roosevelt got along. Taft was easygoing, he was ambitious, but he wasn't cutthroat. Roosevelt had this outsized personality, and uh, he liked, he so enjoyed being the center of attention, he liked <laughs> By 1907, Roosevelt had decided he was not going to run again for president. And Taft seemed to him like the ideal successor. He would continue his, his programs, but he wouldn't overshadow his legacy. So, urged on by Taft's ambitious wife, Nellie, who really, really wanted to be first lady, <laughs> and his boss, Taft said, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. He later called the 1908 campaign the most uncomfortable four months of my life. <laughs> this is strange to us in 2012 for a couple of reasons. One, that a presidential candidate would actually admit to not liking running for president because they're supposed to love it. And also that the campaign was four months long. <laughs> Taft won. Roosevelt decided that he needed to disappear from public life for a bit after the victory and let Taft be his own man. So in a classic Teddy move, he took off on an extended African safari. <laughs> he didn't come back to the US for another 15 months. But even before he left, trouble began. Taft had written Roosevelt a note of thanks after the election, saying thank you so much for your help and getting me into the White House. But he also, in the note, sort of had similar notes of thanks to, he mentioned his brother Charles Taft, who was a big fundraiser, a money guy. And, and Taft basically indicated that Roosevelt and Charles Taft had e got the equal credit. Roosevelt did not like sharing credit with anybody. He fumed at that. And then, right after that, getting this note, Taft let some of Roosevelt's cabinet members go. And Roosevelt thought they had a gentleman's agreement that they were going to keep everybody on. Taft seemed to have some ideas of his own, and Roosevelt did not like it. He told a friend, he means well and he'll do his best, but he's weak. With that, the ex-president steamed away on safari. He and Taft did not correspond for a year. The real problem here wasn't a mismanners violation. Teddy Roosevelt had a hard time not being president anymore. He was 50 years old. He was in great health. He was energetic. And he was unemployed. <laughs> and he was hugely popular. He was also spending a lot of time thinking and absorbing new ideas as he was abroad. After his African safari, he went to Europe. He went on a big speaking tour. And as he gave these speeches, going from Paris to Oxford to London and beyond, he sounded more and more progressive, more even radical at every stop. Now he had been, Roosevelt had been a progressive, uh, a president that the progressive light, progressives thought was one of them. He had made the office of the presidency more powerful. He had pushed through major environmental and regulatory reforms. But the progressives, some of them found him kind of soft on big business. They thought he should do more, act more aggressively to break up business monopolies. But the Roosevelt of summer 1910 was a new political animal. When he returned from overseas that June, it was a national media event. Headlines across the country screamed the return of TR, even in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Roosevelt met a crowd of thousands as he disembarked in New York City. There was a flotilla of boats on the East River going from 24th Street to the Battery. There were thousands of people on the street. It was huge. And by this time, rumors were flying that Taft and Roosevelt 
Roosevelt's relationship was in trouble. Editorial cartoonists agreed. Here we have Roosevelt on his return being greeted by a very scrawny kitty with a little feeble ribbon saying, my policies. And he asks Taft, is that the best care you could take of my cat? Meanwhile, Taft kept on stepping into one public relations fiasco after another. He flip-flopped on key issues in ways that left everybody unhappy with him. As his old boss moved to the left, Taft seemed to move to the right, joining in closer alliances with the old guard Republicans in Congress. The wind was blowing in 1912. Now, the Taft-Roosevelt rift was personal, and it was sometimes petty, but it mirrored a bigger split that was emerging in the Republican Party. So who were the Republicans of 1912? Well, mainstream Republicans of 1912 were conservative in the classical sense. They were the party of industry and enterprise. They were supporters of tariffs on foreign imports. They believed in some government regulation and gradual change. The GOP was still the party of Lincoln. African Americans usually voted Republicans when they could vote. But things like poll taxes and literacy tests in the Jim Crow South had largely disenfranchised the Southern black population by 1912. And this is where the vast majority of African Americans lived. Part of the GOP's dominance in national politics was because its strongholds were in the places where most people lived, the urban Northeast and Midwest. And this is a flip of what we have today, right? We, have, um, we think of the Northeast as blue state central, but then, and for a very long time after, it was a Republican stronghold. The GOP was also the party of political corruption. It had been ruling the roost in Washington during this era when big business had government in its pocket. But it also was the party of the progressive reformers. So many of the progressive, those in the progressive movements came from the core constituencies of the Republican Party, middle class, native born, white collar, urbanites. So the Taft-Roosevelt spat was re reflecting a bigger tug of war for the GOP soul that was underway. The Democrats had an identity crisis too. Who were the Democrats in 1912? They were Western populists farmers and miners of the Great Plains in the West, whose economic futures were now at the mercy of far-off Wall Street capitalists. The discontent of, these, of this constituency had spurred another third-party movement in the 1880s and 1890s, and the short-lived Populist Party, which by this time had become absorbed into the Democratic base. There were Southern whites, the Solid South, who had an economic and social stake in keeping intact the racial order of the Jim Crow South. They believed in states' rights. They believed in small central government. From Reconstruction until the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the Solid South was a critical and a really complicated voting bloc for any Democratic presidential candidate. Foreign-born immigrants also voted Democratic, in part because of the, for the powerful influence of Democratic machines in large cities. And it, it all went around. Both Democrats and Republicans were, the part, were identified with political corruption. And there were also a decent number of progressive reformers that identified as Democratic. So within both parties, you had people who were very concerned about political corruption and felt that the solution was to clean up political corruption through reform. Roosevelt seized on this progressive moment after his return to the US in 1910. He immediately went on a nationwide speaking tour. More had to be done to keep corporations out of politics, Roosevelt told mesmerized crowds. Crowds of 10,000 people, 20,000 people, 30,000 people. This is a guy who's an ex-president, hasn't declared he's going to run again, and is just coming and giving a big policy speech. And they were usually an hour or two long. You guys are getting off so easy tonight. Corporate directors whose companies broke the law should be subject to prosecution, Roosevelt said. Does that sound familiar? And government must do much, much more. Roosevelt called this philosophy the new nationalism, and it would be the theme of his campaign to come. But he still hadn't declared he'd run. Why is that? Well, 
he was a canny politician. He didn't think the Republican Party was ready for him, ready to be this progressive. He thought he might wait until 1916. He didn't have high hopes that Taft would win the White House, but he thought he could win it back for the Republicans with a progressive message in four years. So he still, he still stayed on the sidelines in terms of declaring, but he could not resist the spotlight. And all of this uncertainty and speculation and the triumphant media tours that accompanied it destroyed what was left of the Taft-Roosevelt friendship. Meanwhile, others are trying to win the hearts and minds of progressive Republicans. One really important figure in the 1912 election was Wisconsin Senator Robert La Follette, known as Fightin' Bob. He declared his candidacy in early 1911 as the progressive alternative to the incumbent. But by early 1912, La Follette was melting down. He gave a disastrous two-hour speech that pretty much eliminated him as a serious challenger in early February 1912. And so if progressive Republicans wanted a candidate who would go all the way, Roosevelt really seemed like the best bet. So after La Follette's meltdown, Roosevelt finally stopped being coy and announced he would run for the Republican nomination for president. Funnily enough, Roosevelt's decision to run got his former protege, Taft, to do the one thing he hated doing, which was campaign. Taft may not have wanted to be president, but he really, really did not want Roosevelt to win. So he said, sometimes a man in a corner fights. I am going to fight. A friend later observed of Taft that he was, quote, one of the best haters he had ever known. <laughs> now let's move to our second story, the rise of the modern campaign. And let's be clear about one thing. Woodrow Wilson did not like kissing babies. He was a high-minded introvert, and like most people who decide they should be president, he had a rather large ego. He didn't much like the day-to-day -day business of campaigning. He liked making speeches. He liked talking to thoughtful reporters. He knew that working with party bosses was part of the job, but he didn't relish it. Now, if Wilson had entered politics a couple of decades earlier, this really would have been a liability. 19th century politics was all about working a room, making personal connections. Politics was intensely local. Politics was, in fact, a major source of entertainment. The parties would put on clam bakes and torchlight parades and all sorts of festivals that really built party loyalty. The parties also delivered jobs, political favors, and even Thanksgiving turkeys to those who were loyal to him, them. So this entertaining and patronage-driven system led to extraordinarily high voter, voter turnout, or I should say required high turnout. Take, for example, the 1896 presidential election, when close to 80% of eligible voters went to the polls. And by and large, they're voting straight party line tickets. They aren't splitting their vote. 1996, turnout is down to not even quite 50%. Why was this happening? Progressive reform. In an effort to clean up corruption at all levels of government, progressives had instituted a variety of measures. One was the institution of professional civil service systems. So under the old regime, patronage driven, you could have someone's politically connected Uncle Jimmy that was uh, appointed to be head of the city water bureau. After civil service, the Water Bureau would be run by a professionally trained, nonpartisan water systems expert. Another change was the institution of mechanisms of direct democracy, the initiative and the referendum. Now, all of us who live in Western states are very familiar with these. <laughs> um, we are all probably sitting, making, blocking out hours in the next few weeks to sit down with a voter guide and figure out what exactly they're trying to get us to vote for or against. These, we have the progressives to thank for that. These were taking, taking lawmaking out of the hands of state legislatures that were seen to be corrupt under the thumb of and bringing them to the people, having the people decide 
a more democratic process. And in doing that, they diminish the power of the parties, diminish the power of the elected officials who are members of those parties. A third innovation was the direct primary. Under the old system, primaries happened often literally in smoke-filled rooms. They were closed-door sessions with the party faithful. The direct primary opens us up, creates polling places, creates a more systematized process. And so all of this diminishes the party's power. As the elections got to be less about parties, they became to be more about candidates. And this changed the way people campaigned for president. And not all of the candidates in 1912 had cottoned on to this change. Political, in the old system, candidates could stay out of the fray. To us in 2012, this seems astounding. But the way it used to work is, say you were an incumbent president. You would just mostly stay and do your day job. And you would have party operatives and surrogates go on the road and say all sorts of things and give all the speeches on your behalf. And you would stay and hang out and run a Rose Garden campaign and make the occasional speech, but not really travel all that much. In the new system, candidates, whether incumbent or not, had to get hit the road giving speech after speech. The bigger the crowd, the better. They needed to be strategic in the places they visited and when they visited them. This all seems obvious to us now, but this was very foreign, very new in, 20, in 1912. And when this happens, winning or losing starts to depend a little more on the character, the personality, the charisma of the man who is running. Another big change is the rise of the national media. Based in New York City, but allowing news to spread quickly across the country. Technology is allowing news from elections to baseball scores to go from coast to coast in a matter of minutes. The rise of national newspaper chains also means that there are these singular editorial voices that are telling people how to think about politics from coast to coast. And it also means that other things are starting to grab Americans' attention, like sensational crimes and sports and entertainment, show business stories. So, um, this is another thing that's contributing to a changing role of politics and a, and a increased drive for a, a different sort of entertainment taking the place in Americans', Americans lives. Woodrow Wilson benefited from this new media. One, he was in New Jersey, so all he had to do was get on a train and take a quick hop jump into New York City and talk to his editors and reporters who very quickly said, oh, this guy is great. We're going to write about him and talk about him. And he quickly, even though he was only elected governor of New Jersey in 1910, he quickly gets a national reputation because of this viral national media. In fact, Woodrow Wilson clubs start popping up all over the country, even before he declares as president. Wilson was also a really alluring choice to an embattled Democratic Party that really wanted to win back the White House and Congress. He was a buttoned-down, reasonable fellow, in stark contrast to liberal firebrand William Jennings Bryan, who had been the losing candidate, Dem Democratic nominee, in three of the past four presidential races. This cartoon from 1912 shows Brian trying to open the, can't figure out the combination to the, the, the safe of the presidency, while Wilson and the other Democratic contenders are saying, I have it, I know it, I know the combination. Wilson also had a lot of appeal to, others, uh, to Southern states' rights Democrats. He was a Southerner. He was from Virginia. He had spent his life, in the, his, his early life in the Reconstruction South. And he generally hewed to Southern thinking in terms of racial issues, states' rights, believed in a small, smaller national government. And so he was a really different breed of progressive than Roosevelt. As governor, he was championing, championing, championing progressive causes like workmen's compensation and regulation of public utilities. But he was also uh, quite different from Roosevelt's new nationalism. He didn't like it at all. He called it this exaltation of federal centralization power. But Wilson was still a new kind of Democrat. And he was made possible by the new media, new politics, and this age of reform. Now, it campaign was entirely a modern one. And one part of the process that remained firmly stuck in the 19th century was the party convention. For the Republicans, personal resentments and the internal party tensions had marked a really uh, nail-biting primary season. Taft and Roosevelt's attacks on each other got fiercer and fiercer as the spring wore on. 
Here are some of the things they, some of the names they called each other. Taft called Roosevelt a dangerous egotist and a demagogue. Roosevelt called Taft a puzzle wit, a fat head, and a flub dub. <laughs> and I think all of us should send helpful emails to the campaign of our candidate of choice for president this, this year and say, here are some good things you could call your opponent. Um, and who says politics was clean back then? It was nasty. Despite the wild popularity of Roosevelt, the race was a very close one. And this was mostly Roosevelt's fault. Because despite being this celebrity candidate, despite having these crowds of reporters and all these people show up and just, you know, uh, he had all these worshipers following him everywhere he went, he didn't really do his old politics very well. He was so swept up in a celebrity, he really mistook that for tangible political support within the party. And then he spent all that time in 1911 deciding whether to run or not. So by the time he got around, his people went to go lock up the delegates for the convention, they found that Taft's people had gotten there first. And even though there were a lot of direct primaries um, during, this, uh, during this, this, this presidential season, they weren't binding, meaning that, they had, uh, that the delegates didn't necessarily have to vote that way during the convention. So vote for vote, Roosevelt wins the primaries by a really big margin. And so if you, and if you look at Roosevelt and LaFollette's votes together, the progressive faction is, is out polling Taft two to one, pretty much. The national convention is very different. If new politics was the primaries, old politics was the convention. When the convention opened, there were so many contested delegates that no single candidate had enough for the nomination. It was open, open season. So Roosevelt decides it's time for some bold moves, for some new politics. So he bucks tradition. Usually the candidates don't even show up at the conventions during this, this era. He comes to Chicago where the convention's happening and has a predictably a rock star's reception. He doesn't go into the hall, but he's right outside calling, causing a big ruckus outside of it. But inside the hall, it's politics as usual. Taft's party machinery swings into action. And the result? Taft got nearly all the contested delegates, and he got the nomination. Inside the convention hall, fist fights broke out. When Taft's reporters tried to, supporters tried to take the floor, Roosevelt's people whistled and shouted, steamroller! Roosevelt delegates sat on their hands when the vote was finally taken. So the GOP convention was old politics at its finest, and Taft, the reluctant politician, won. The Democratic convention was even more dramatic, if you can believe it. It took one place one week later in Baltimore, and when it opened, Woodrow Wilson didn't even have close to the majority of delegates. And Democrats, unlike Republicans, had to, uh, the winning nominee had to get two-thirds of the delegates, so it was even a, a, a bigger lift. The leader in the delegate count was this fellow named Champ Clark, who was Speaker of the House. He was a plain-talking Missourian, old-style party politician. He was fond of saying things like, I sprang from the loins of the common people, God bless them, and I am one of them and in something that will warm the hearts of all the dogs here, or maybe not, his campaign theme song had a chorus that went, quit kicking my dog around. <laughs> Even though he had the delegate lead, the conventional wisdom was that Clark was not up to the job of being president, and Wilson took advantage of that. Over the course of multiple rounds of balloting, day after day of the convention, Wilson steadily And on that 46th round of voting, Wilson got it. So Wilson's victory had to do with smart politics, and it had to do with luck. Uh, one pundit later said of Wilson, if he was to fall out of a 16-story building, he would hit on a feather bed. <laughs> Wilson saw a higher power at work. Later, after his election, he would say quite simply, God ordained me to be the next president of the United States. And we thought religion wasn't in politics. Now it's time for our third and final chapter, the role of government 
And the place to start is the Progressive Party Convention in Chicago in August 1912. Once Taft beat Roosevelt, the ex-president did what people had suspected he would do for a long time, he bolted. He left, uh, left the Republican Party, which had been his home for his career, took a large cohort of the reform faction with him, and became the presidential candidate of the newly created Progressive Party, a party that became so closely identified with Roosevelt, despite running a lot of uh, candidates that year in different races, that it became known as the Bull Moose Party by Roosevelt's nickname. Talk about a study in contrasts. The Progressive Party convention was a Teddy Roosevelt love fest. Reporters there compa compared it to a religious revival. Roosevelt himself contributed to the tone by titling his keynote address, A Confession of Faith. As Roosevelt stepped up to deliver it, he first basked in nearly an hour of cheers, applause, the singing of hymns, patriotic songs. Again, you guys are getting off so easy. <laughs> Once the hall had finally quieted, he delivered a speech that was part sermon, part stem winder, putting forth ideas that would have been considered radical only a few years before. The old parties are husks with no real soul. They're boss-ridden, privilege-controlled. There must be a new party representing the cause of human rights and of governmental efficiency. I love the coupling of those two things. <laughs> After a speech, everyone in the hall was so moved that all had to join in a singing of the Battle Hymn of the Republic just to calm down. Through the course of that fall, Roosevelt traveled back and forth across the country spreading this progressive gospel. And he introduced policy ideas that foreshadowed ideas that his cousin Franklin would uh, introduce over 20 years later. He called for regulation to ensure on-the-job safety. He talked about providing infrastructure to the flood-prone Mississippi River Valley. He proposed a minimum wage for women and restrictions on child labor. Now, the Progressive Party, again, wasn't Teddy Roosevelt. It ran a lot of candidates, but it was so dominated by Roosevelt's celebrity. And he had changed into such a complete progressive on the campaign trail that even the Republican elephant here says, suffering snakes, how Theodore has changed. In trumpeting this new progressive message, Teddy Roosevelt stole a lot of Eugene Debs' thunder. Remember him? By 1912, the Socialist Party had in, earned a certain degree of respectability. It had elected those mayors in Milwaukee and in Syracuse. It had won close to half a million votes in 1904 and 1908. So Debs fumed when Roosevelt started saying things that he had been saying for years. He got particularly annoyed when Roosevelt stole the Socialist brand by making a red kerchief the symbol of the new Progressive Party. Debs took on the progressives directly, saying in one speech, the new progressive party is a party of progressive capitalism. It is lavishly financed and shrewdly advertised, but it stands for the rule of capitalism all the same. Now, Debs was good at taking people down and not so good at saying what he would do differently. His speeches were energetic, but they were skimpy on the policy details. And, and people were nervous about, <laughs> about socialism. Socialism still, you know, wasn't in t it was still a somewhat dirty word among, in many circles. And the rise of the Progressive Party gave an outlet for people who were frustrated with the two major parties to migrate to a third party cause. So the Progressives took up some of the radicals' ideas, but it left a lot of the radicals behind. Roosevelt's rhetoric pushed Woodrow Wilson further to the left as well. After securing his nomination, Wilson hit the trail with a series of fiery speeches. Like Roosevelt's, they railed against the money trusts and corporate greed. But the solutions that Wilson proposed were different in ways that revealed a different political philosophy. Roosevelt had new nationalism. Wilson had new freedom. Wilson's new freedom platform was also about government activism and social change, but it was about making things smaller, not bigger. Wilson believed in breaking up monopolies. 
Roosevelt was about, he was okay with keeping them big, but regulated. Rose, Wilson believed in states' rights and a limited central government. Roosevelt was about a more powerful central state. Wilson scorned Roosevelt's expansive vision, and he cast doubt on how new his ideas really were. The predictions of the leader of the new party are as alarming as the predictions of the various stand patters, meaning the conservatives, conservative Republicans. He criticized TR for promoting the overwhelming power and sovereignty of the national government. At the end of the day, both men had the same goals and thought political action was the way to achieve them. But they had different visions of how Washington, D.C. should go about it. This distinction would have really important legacy on the way politics played out over the course of the century, of the 20th century, and into the 21st. We're still debating these two different approaches. So let's fast forward to October 1912. By then, the election was all about Roosevelt and Wilson. Eugene Debs was off preaching to the socialist faithful, but he wasn't making that many converts. And Taft, man, Taft could not get a break. The press was paying all the attention to Wilson and to Roosevelt. And Taft complains, there is no news for me except that I played golf. To add insult to injury, Taft's vice president, James Ch Sherman, dies about a week before election day. I know. Forcing him to rustle up a last minute replacement, the president of Columbia University. You know, no one's paying attention to academics. Um, but by that point, no one seemed to notice or care. <laughs> by the fall, the Republican Party establishment had pretty much realized that Taft was not going to win, and they really did not want Roosevelt to win. They were ticked off. Um, so some of them actively campaigned for Wilson to win. So as happens in a lot of presidential elections, victory is, um, is wrestled because of who you, who you run against and what happens to them. And the implosion in the GOP was really why Democrat Woodrow Wilson was allowed to win the presidency, the reason he won. But I still have one last twist for you in this pivotal campaign. It wasn't all over yet. On October 14th, nearly 100 years ago today, Roosevelt arrived in Milwaukee. After many days on the road, he'd been to 32 states, 150 speeches. Milwaukee was a socialist stronghold and a great place to bring his message to the political left. Just like everywhere on the campaign trail, crowds surrounded Roosevelt in his car as he moved from the hotel to the venue where he was speaking. And he stood up to shake hands with some admirers, and someone, a man, got up and shot him in the chest. This, bu this bullet should have killed Roosevelt, but it didn't. Because in his breast pocket was a glasses case. See page speech, of the, a transcript of the speech he was about to deliver. Bleeding from the chest, Roosevelt shrugged off medical help and said, I'm giving this speech. Classic. Now, if he wasn't, uh, and as he, as he gives a speech, he famously tells his audience, it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. <laughs> if Roosevelt wasn't already a legend, doing that would have made him one. It dominated the news for the rest of the campaign. Odds makers before this, the shooting put uh, Teddy's odds at four to one. Afterwards, it was two to one. And after suspending the campaign to allow Roosevelt to recover, Wilson went back on the stump for a furious last round of speeches and events. So did Roosevelt. <laughs> Election day was November 5th. And it was an electoral landslide for Wilson. He won 40 states. Roosevelt won six. That's the yellow you see here, including Washington State. Taft won two. The popular vote was less clear-cut. Like Bill Clinton, eight decades later, Wilson only won a plurality, not a majority, of the popular vote. Roosevelt came in second with 27, Taft third with 23 percent. 
So the Democrat, the, the split in the GOP, as you see from this popular breakout, really changed the, the, the popular vote calculus, if not the electoral one. The Socialists won nearly a million votes, but their total fell far short of what Debs and his colleagues had hoped at the beginning. They really thought this was going to be a socialist moment when they could really make some noise and get a, a big chunk of the, of, the, of the popular vote. Not win at all, but, but just make, make a bigger impression. But the progressives stole a lot of their thunder. Turnout in the election of 1912 demonstrated how much the political system had changed in this age of reform. Overall, less than 60% of eligible voters went to the the polls. Contrast again to 1896, 80% went to the polls. So this set in place a trend that continues today. 2008's turnout was about 60% as well. Wilson not only won the White House, but the Democrats won control of both houses of Congress. It was a good year to be a Democrat in 1912. And this actually meant passage of a number of reformist policies that Teddy Roosevelt had introduced on the campaign trail. They owed Teddy Roosevelt and his progressives a big debt. William Howard Taft left the job he hated. But in 1921, he got the job that he always dreamed of because Warren Harding appointed him Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. After defeat, Teddy Roosevelt went hunting again. He set off on a 16-month 16 16 long voyage down the Amazon. Along the way, he contracted malaria and a serious leg infection. And although he came back and stayed active in national affairs, he never again ran for president. And it's generally thought that those, those illnesses and injuries really uh, made him much, a much less healthy guy for the rest of his life. He died at an untimely early age of 60 in 1919. William Howard Taft came to Roosevelt's funeral. And it said that he stayed longer than anyone else, weeping by Roosevelt's grave. So why was 1912 a pivotal election? It was when America's reckoning with big industrial changes hit mainstream politics and changed it for good. One, the reckoning changed the two major parties, but it didn't destroy them. 1912 was a moment when either the Democrats or the Republicans could have become the progressive party. After 1912, conservatives consolidated their power in the GOP. And the Republicans went forth in the 20th century as the party of small government, of unfettered markets, or, less, or somewhat fettered markets, and fiscal conservatism. The Democrats absorbed a lot of the interests and the policies and the people of the progressive cause, and over time became the progressive. Now, there's some lessons about third parties here that resonate across many elections. Third parties introduce new ideas into the political system in really, really important ways. But they lack the organization to sustain the momentum often after their headliner candidates have left the stage. Instead, what happens, had happened again and again, is the two major parties open their tent flaps and bring the new parties and their voters in. The second reason 1912 was pivotal was it was the beginning of presidential campaigning as we know it, love it or hate it. Political reform in the new media made elections about candidates, not about parties. Charisma and celebrity ma mattered. See, for example, Teddy Roosevelt. Barnstorming tours and good relationships with the media mattered, as we see in the story of Woodrow Wilson. And relying on the party, the party bosses and running your campaign from the Rose Garden doesn't work, as we see in the story of William Howard Taft. The third thing and third reason that this is a pivotal election is the way that it refine, redefined the role of government in industrial America. And in 1912, it's a lot of talk, not as much action, but it's setting up this debate that continues today. And that's why the campaigns can, can somehow sometimes put change in motion that doesn't become apparent for a few decades on. The 1912 election was one where a consensus emerged across the political spectrum that a government should do more than just deliver the mail and have a standing army. It should have a more visible presence in American life. It should protect workers. It should regulate markets. It should ensure basic freedoms. Now, 
Politicians then and politicians now generally agree on the basic principles here, but differ on the way to get there. Are we a nation that has an activist central government where markets are strongly regulated? Do we spend big? Do we raise taxes? Or are we a nation that has less interference in individual lives, freer workings of the market, lower taxes? These are still things that we're debating. Now, it wasn't as if everything changed and stayed that way after 1912. The political road is rarely that straight. Change takes time. In the 1920s, politics actually went back to the old ways. Parties adapted. They figured out how to use the reformed system, the media-driven system. They regained some of their power, not as much as they had, but they adapted to it. As a result, things seemed to go quiet in Washington, D.C. in the 1920s. There were still progressive reforms going on at the state and local level, but not as much at the national level. But as the 1930s would show, the progressive impulse was dormant. It wasn't dead. So on the next Pivotal Tuesday, we'll explore what happened when those progressive ideas came back and continue to look at what the legacies have been on the politics that we have today. So thank you all very much. Now I got to talk to you, and now you get to talk to me if you'd like, and I'm happy to take questions from the audience. We have a couple of mics set up in the aisles. Um, if anyone needs to leave, you can, or take a bathroom break and come back, or leave altogether, you're welcome to, but if you would like to stay for Q&A, please do, and uh, just come up to the microphones and we'll talk for a few more minutes. Uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, I'm curious what the discussion was in the 1912 campaign about, I guess, what we'd call today foreign policy, mm -hmm. uh, specifically looking forward to the Great War that was kind of on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, if, if there was any, any statements made by any of the major camp, guess Taft, Roosevelt, or Wilson, mm -hmm. and if you think that, that would have, there would have been any major changes in America's role in between 1912 and 1916, mm -hmm. um, if, if anybody could have, if, if any of that was even part of the discussion. Yeah, that's a great question. The question about foreign was a factor in the 1912 campaign. Um, well, one part of the answer is that's, I could, I could spend, keep you guys here for another two hours talking about sort of Wilsonian um, democracy and World War II and the, the, elect, the decade to come. Um, and I will say one of the things that I have created as a web resource on my, on my website that you can link to from the history department that will have more reading about um, Wilson and, um, and Roosevelt and also links to uh, sources that talk about foreign policy as well. The short answer is it really wasn't that much of a big um, issue on the stump, that domestic issues um, trumped. Now, the question of sort of U.S. imperialism, anti-imperialism was still a very live one, the question of how much the U.S. should or should not intervene in foreign affairs. Um, but, you know, it's surprising considering that we were on the eve of war in Europe, that if you look at what the really live issues were um, and the real sort of hot debates of the campaign, it was less about foreign policy and more about domestic policy. Um, and where it came down to was a lot of debate about economic policy and tariffs and the degree to which we were going to what, what trade policy was going to be and how much we were going to open our borders, the U.S. was going to open its borders to foreign goods, um, foreign manufactured goods. Yeah. Thanks for the lecture. Um, one of the oddities of the progressive era is how politicized people seem to have been, yeah. particularly middle class people, and yet voter turnout falls off beginning mm -hmm. then. How do you explain that? Well, you know, people were politicized um, in a... Uh, in a kind of a small p politics sort of way, that they were very energized about, um, they were activists, but uh, a lot of them had a real skepticism about the system. I think there was a real sort of distrust of government and a feeling like um, uh, not everyone thought that, the, that, that formal politics was the way to affect change. Um, but turnout was you know, driven so high by these kind of artificial bumps of patronage and um, uh, and, and kind of these relationships that the parties would form with their voters. They would get out the vote in these very, very aggressive ways. And when you have people who are kind of positioning themselves outside of party, 
they aren't just going to the part, going to the polls by reflex, like, okay, I gotta go vote now, because if I don't vote, I'm not gonna get my, you know, my Uncle Jimmy's not gonna get a job, or I'm not gonna get my Thanksgiving turkey. Um, that, that it's a different sort of, a different sort of dynamic at play. So part of the, the irony of it was, is that kind of the, the, the progressives really wanted to, um, just had such a distaste for politics that it, 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 it and, and, and when you, and then when you kind of say that these, these ra the rabble that are voting for the Democrats and the Republicans, these people who are just voting for the Thanksgiving turkey, when you're saying that this is, you're part of the problem, you shouldn't be part of the system, then people are less interested in voting. You know, they, they've, they've been excluded. I mean, they, the progressives talk about democracy all the time, these instruments of democracy. But the way that we think about democracy, right, is giving everyone a voice regardless of their class status or, you know, that's a broad-based, you're a citizen and you get a voice. And um, the, the progressives were very much about, they wanted an educated citizen having a voice. And they didn't really want the uneducated immigrant having as much say as the college-educated, you know, enlightened reformer who knew better. So it was this idea, they didn't care as much about turnout going down, quite honestly, because if fewer people were voting, it meant the people who were voting were more informed. Hamiltonian democracy at its finest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you talked about how the uh, 1912 Republican Convention transpired. And apparently, because of this, the Republican Party made a lot of changes in how they assigned delegates and so on. And apparently, they still use those rules today. I just read that mm -hmm. in the newspaper during this. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk about how those rules changed. Oh, my. Um, I think that would take more time than we, than we have, yeah, okay. but it evolves. It evolves over time, and I think there was a real um, the, the 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 longer story on the Republican convention had to do with a lot of, of backroom deals, and really, um, the assessment is that that there were some some delegate votes stolen by the Taft people. That that it was not above board. That they were able to work the system in the way that not only. You know, the Wilson story, the Wilson Champ Clark story was one of you just hammer away and round and round and round and round and finally got enough delegates. The coming out of the 1912 Republican convention, there was a there were a lot of accusations, some of them grounded, um, that delegates had been stolen, had been obtained. Um, that really prompted a, a kind of reassessment. And there were, you know, even in the it wasn't like the conservative wing of the Republican Party was cronies. It was full of people who were sort of very high minded and kind of wanted the system to work well. Um, so that does instigate a round of reforms. But of course, these parties are, the conventions are getting reformed, the rules are getting reformed continually all the way into the 70s when we have sort of the most fundamental reform that really takes, makes the conventions no longer nail biters and makes them what they are today. Thanks. Thank you. We have one more question up there. Yeah. Was immigration an issue in 1912 as it is in the United States today? And was there an influence of the Klan and the Know Nothings in the elections of 1912? Um, immigration was very much an issue. Um, it was a very live issue. The, um, the Klan and uh, anti-immigrant se sentiment really reaches a crescendo in the 1920s. Um, the, the Ku Klux Klan has its highest membership um, in, in the 1920s. Most of those members were not in the South. Um, but the, the anti-immigrant sen sentiment um, is, is there, but what really politicizes it is World War II and the Bolshevik Revolution. And so, you know, Eugene Debs' after story is that, um, you know, after 19, 1912 is kind of the high point of socialist respectability or acceptance, mainstreaming. And um, after World War II, you have this margin you know, of feeling, not only do you have this sort of anti-German sentiment, anti-European sentiment, um, persecution of German Americans, of, of immigrants from, from um, the, the countries that, that we're fighting. But then the Russian Revolution makes socialism truly a, a dirty word and, and, and really puts uh, the hunt for sub subversives in full gear. Um, in 1919, there's a, you know, a red scare. There's a lot of persecution of members of the Communist Party, Socialist Party, as we know well here in Seattle, which was a real hotbed of radical activity and, um, and radical unionism. This was um, where a lot of these issues um, came to a, to a head and to a very violent um, series of, in of incidents through uh, the teens and into the 20s. So it becomes more of a, of a live grenade in the 20s, the elections during the 20s. And this is after immigration, significant Im immigration restrictions are enacted in the early 20s. Here, yeah. And is in the way Teddy and Taft fractured the Republican Party, can you see any analogy between what's happening now with a, a 
two very divergent elements mm -hmm. within the Republican Party? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I think there's a, um, I think what's happening with the Republican Party and the Tea Party is a wonderful example of the kind of, um, the, the, the opening up the tent flaps that, that the Republican Party saw in 2008, 2009, that the Tea Party was really a significant force and there were issues that needed to be addressed and um, that it had the potential to be a third party, present a third party challenge in 2012. And um, there's a, I think the kind of, the, the Republican Party kind of being willing to embrace, make the Tea Party's issues, some of the Tea Party's issues, its issues, and bring a lot of those activists in, and more, more importantly, elect Republican members to Congress in 2010 who were kind of Tea Party, had Tea Party credentials that were coming from that movement and were speaking for that movement, um, has made it, uh, you know, it's, it's changed the profile of the party and it's probably moved it on balance to the right. Um, in, in a certain a certain different dimension of moving to the right, there's social conservative conservatism, there's Tea Party conservatism, and there's a sort of Venn diagram with some overlap but not completely congruent. And there are probably many many people who are you know who who feel strongly you know, identify as as members of the Tea Party or Tea Party movements who do not feel like they belong to the Republican Party either. So I shouldn't sort of generalize about that. But they uh, they they there's this uh, they've moved to the the Republican Party is not in danger of, well, we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens with what the verdict will be on this election, but what they decided was, we, you know, we can't let this break us apart. We need to bring, bring, it, bring it in together. And there's a lot of harmony with what um, uh, the, the current party, sort of party platform was and what the, the Tea Party demands have been. And there's, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend as part of what goes, goes on in a lot of these things. You know, who are, we, who are we trying to get rid of? These other guys because we think their vision is wrong for the country spectrum often. Yeah, hi. Do you know why uh, Washington State and California didn't go for Wilson? Why Washington State and California didn't go for Wilson? Um, because they were uh, hotbeds of progressivism, of progressive reform, and super receptive to Teddy Roosevelt's message. Um, there is, again, a reason that all of us are stuck voting for all these initiatives and referenda all the time. Um, we love them. Direct democracy. Love it. Um, California and Washington are early movers in that. Um, and, and they are, uh, really have a lot, of, uh, a lot of support up and down the political spectrum. You have um, the Republican Party um, in California and in Washington has a very, very progressive cast. So the, it, even within the Republican Party predating um, 1912, there's a really, really strong progressive tendency. Hiram Johnson is elected uh, governor of California in, in 1910, a progressive. And it's no surprise, I mean, Washington and California, I mean, California progressivism is very much a reaction to the power of the railroads. And um, these are, you know, the, the, the Frank Norris famously, famously calls it the octopus, the, 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 the railroads that kind of control everything in California for so long. And, the, uh, and, and so direct democracy and reform and progressivism becomes this response to that, try a power play to get some of that back. Okay, so thank you all so much. <laughs>